Welcome back to another episode of We Are Being Transformed, a podcast where we explore the myriad of ways that people are uh, transformed and in turn shape the culture around them, uh, whether that be through ritual, lore, religion, etc. Um, and today I just want to give a trigger warning. Um, the content in this episode will be um, quite graphic at times. We discuss acts of sexual violence and human trafficking uh, at moments. So if you or someone you know is a victim of sexual violence, please contact Rain. Um, you can contact them at 1-800-656-4673. Uh, um, similarly, if you or someone you know is a victim of human or sex trafficking, please contact the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888. Um, and we will include the links in the description below. So with that being said, I would like to welcome back to the show, the one, the only, Dr. Celine Lilly. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. Thanks, Jason. How are you? I am fantastic. Uh, honored to have you back on the show. Um, so, <laughs> awesome. Um, so, in our last discussions, we really talked and got into the meat of the matter with uh, Roman self-definition and the violence that entailed through mapping that masculine self-definition. We also, in another episode, we tackled um, how the Nag Hammadi texts like On the Origin of the World, um, Reality of the Rulers, and The Secret Book of John um, really tended to act as a sort of uh, cultural critique. Um, what these texts have in common, um, just academically, how they're grouped together, uh, they're usually considered not, uh, sorry, cut, Neil. <laughs> okay, so three, two, one. Okay, start here. So these texts, um, they're usually grouped together in, in academia as um, quote unquote, Sethian texts. Um, they share a certain lore, certain um, aspects of uh, the mythology, if you will. There's a story, as Dylan Burns would say, uh, with all this uh, that's going on. Um, so I think what's interesting is that even though you have a very, um, how shall I say, a very uh, complex cosmo uh, cosmology here, cosmogony, um, it's not just like these patriarchal figures that are at the figurehead of things. There are, um, for lack of a better term, Eve, uh, Noria, Sophia are, are more or less, in a very real sense, savior figures. So I was wondering if you could um, expand upon that a little bit. Yeah, it's really, um, it's really interesting. Uh, to see the ways, and especially, you know, just even thinking about, you know, they get called Sethian literature, and, like, Seth basically doesn't show, I mean, he, he like, his name is mentioned once in um, in Reality of the Rulers, and I'm trying to think if he's mentioned at all in On the Origin of the World. Like, Seth is so minor there. He plays a, a little bit larger role in um, in Secret Revelation of John, but, um, but you know, not but in in these two texts in particular, it's really, really Eve. And then obviously in reality of the rulers is the one where Noria shows up. And I think one of the things that I found really interesting, so a, so yes, just this fact that we have these female um these female figures that that really form this conglomerate of um these shifting names of, you know, the wisdom Sophia, Zoe life, um Eve, um, the beast or the serpent, who's also called the instructor, is part of this kind of female, um, female androgynous. Like it's an interesting thing too. So much of the time in these ancient texts, you get androgynous figures, but they they tend towards the masculine. And here we get these androgynous figures who kind of tend towards the feminine. Um, per, and particularly is named that in uh, in on the origin of the world. And I'm and. So um, it's just a real, I, you know, in thinking about um, it, it excites me. There's so much that I could say about it. It's hard to kind of pick one track, but I guess maybe the two things that I'd say that are really interesting are um, in, in On the Origin of the World in particular, when, uh, 
the uh, the rulers make their Adam to try and seduce her. And um, as Karen King kind of always jokes, you know, they huff and they puff and they can't get um, they can't get Adam to stand up. And first he's given a soul and then he, but he still can't stand. And Eve says to um, Eve says to him, you know, Adam arise, stand. And the text actually says, and her word became a work. So much like the God at the beginning of Genesis, her words are actually efficacious and she's able to save Adam from um, kind of from from this spiritless form that he has at this point. Um, she's also the one technically who, you know, again, and what amalgam of this, it's it's interesting, but he is also saved through the eating of the, the fruit, through these this amalgam of figures, um, the tree, the um, the serpent, the beast, the instructor, um, the the fleshy Eve. And also then to think about just these resonances with um you know, with the Christ figure, if these indeed are Christian stories, which I, I think there's so much more we could say about that. But, um, you know, you have a penetrated, feminized um, savior figure in Jesus. And that was one of the things about crucifixion is that it was emasculating because it was penetrative. And um, and here you have the same thing through sexual violence. And that, um, again, you know, these children end up becoming kind of the saviors of humanity, specifically with um, with Noria, who we can say a lot more about. Yeah. And even just getting back to, um, Eve for a second, I mean, it's, it's not just, this came out of thin air. I mean, if, um, if you read the Septuagint and, um, the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of uh, the old Testament, um, the Hebrew Bible, um, you'll notice that in the first three chapters, she's not named Eve. She's called Zoe. She's uh, so this is not something that they're just kind of making up. It's something that they're they're gleaning from the text and they're interpreting in their own way, which I, I you know, I just find that fascinating. You know, I, I love that. Um, um, but yeah, uh, we could talk more about that, but maybe that's for another time. Um, what I really wanted to ask you about was what can we kind of gather uh, what little we can, what, what can we gather about the communities who circulated these texts from these markers of these strong, important female savior figures, like um, if anything at all? I mean, I think there, I, you know, I think there's so much speculation that we could, um, there's so much that we could speculate. Um, what can, what can we know for sure? Um, who knows? But I think, you know, to, I was going to say two, but there's probably, there's probably three or more that I'll list. Um, but some of the things that I think we can notice are that these are folks who are interested in, they are interested in gender. There is a bunch of gender fluidity that's going on um, in these texts. Um, again, something, you know, uh, in On the Origin of the World, thinking about they there's like this hymn to Eve that mirrors Thunder Perfect Mind and, you know, which also has a bunch of gender fluidity in it. And so noticing, noticing these, um, this interesting playfulness around this that happens there, um, noticing the ways in which they, they talk about gender and violence, that it really upends this hierarchical model that we have, um, in the, in the Roman system. And so there is, there are, they're definitely interested in having, um, what they would consider, and I don't, I don't necessarily want to speculate the scope of this, but they are interested in justice, um, despite the fact that many folks think that they're only interested in kind of the the people who wrote these texts are only interested in evacuating this world. You know, the sparks get liberated back, you know, into the heavens. I think they're very interested in what happens in this world, and um, although I I do think that they may. Um, when I look at the ends of some of the texts where there seems to, to not be, um, there seems to not be a lot of hope around um, the possibility of things shifting at times where the only thing that they can imagine is kind of a fiery ending. Um, and yet at the same time, um, there does seem to be a real community feel in a lot of these texts that it's not about individuals, but particularly with the relationship even between 
um, all of these female figures that that help one another with Eve and Adam, that there is something very, very important that it's saying about um, relationship and partnership and how people should be with one another and treat treat one another. And so these are communities that um, that at least care about striving for these things. Well said, well said. Thank you for that answer. You were mentioning uh, Thunder Perfect Mind and, and it kind of brought to mind, um, there's a section in um, Reality of the Rulers, a very graphic scene where um, after assaulting Eve, uh, the, the, they these rulers, these archons, um, quote unquote, defile Eve's voice. Um, kind of, and it reminded me of Thunder Perfect Mind and there's, because there's a section in there and it, um, one of my favorite lines in there and, and uh, the character or the, uh, the figure goes, I am hearing adequate for everyone and speaking that cannot be repressed. And that just really kind of um, stood out to me. I was wondering what you thought the significance of these archons trying to silence Eve by defiling the voice, but they can at the end do it, you know? So um, I was wondering your thoughts on that. It, I do wonder, and again, you know, this is the place where uh, I have to say, you know, I'm I'm a modern person in the modern world, and so um, so this may be anachronistic, but I do wonder if some of it is really about silencing her that you know, and um, that that these types of violence are supposed to be unspeakable to protect the people who perpetrate them, and if that really is a, a piece of this, is that um, um, and. And I think, quite frankly, they're pissed at her because this female voice calls them out. And, you know, this is, again, not part of this imperial system. And I think it's one of the things that I think that I find um, really compelling about the way that Karen King talks about this, that somehow, you know, Sophie is this fallen character and yet, um, and yet she's the one that's constantly calling out these male power dynamics. And so there's something really, there's something, there's something really fascinating happening with this where, where, and I think that moments like that really point to this place of, um, parody critique, how we think about satire in the contemporary world, that um, those places where there are disjunctures, where it's like, this doesn't make logical sense. Well, when you start to put it in these other contexts and notice that it's trying to poke fun at something, all of a sudden there are these other, you know, a myriad of other possibilities for interpretation. Right. Absolutely. Um, it's kind of like, um, I mean, even like something like 20 years ago, like my son can still look at like a trailer for um, Airplane and find that funny, but he's not going to get all the uh, all the, uh, the subtle satire in there. Same thing if you're reading Aristophanes, right? Uh, you're not going to get all of the parody that's in Lizzie Strada, right? So unless like you understand the politics of the time. So yeah, very, well said. Um, final question for you. Um, why is it important, uh, do you think, for readers today to know and discover figures like Noria, Eve, and Sophia? I think that they continue to intervene into the binary gender dynamics that we have inherited in so many ways. I think, um, you know, though in, um, you know, in Jewish tradition, God has no image. We have really managed to image God as um, as a male, as a particular type of father figure that I actually do think um, also the early Christian texts subvert kind of what this father figure is supposed to be in certain ways. But um, again, this gets co-opted, gets co-opted again by the empire. So um, I think there are pieces there that are so that are just so so very important about having this myriad of images that different people can relate to and see themselves in the story. The one thing I do think I just really want to say about um, Noria before we go is um, there have been, and I I really understand these critiques, and it's something that I wrestle with. But um, this idea that as um, as the rulers are threatening her, she cries out um, 
to the divine realm and Aleleth steps in and saves her. And there has there have been um, interpretations of this kind of saying, you know, once again, you know, it's the male coming in to save the day for um, for this female figure. And I just keep wondering, like, is there a way to think about this? And I do, I talk about this in my book as well. Like, why is it that, why is the bravery of crying out for help and actually being met in that a bad thing? And I think this is one of the ways in which, um, we, I myself do this too, tend to map our hyper individualistic society onto, onto these constructs. And I just think that, you know, anybody, if there is a possibility of intervening on your own behalf in violence that's coming at you, by all means, cry out for help to whoever is there. And if somebody comes to meet you, all the more the better that that's something that's empowering to use your voice in that way rather than um rather than having it you know be this oh you know i'm just you know i'm like the poor damsel in distress who's you know once again calling in a male savior for myself and i think the thing that i that i also just want to point out about this is that you know it, it does say when when she's born the text says so this is um reality of the rulers that she is um the virgin who uh, who the rulers don't defile. So these are two things that go hand in hand, but it's so important to remember that being a virgin in the ancient world isn't just about sex. It's also about kind of being able to be autonomous. So if we think about like Artemis and what Daphne was actually trying to do, she didn't want to get married because she wanted to run around with Artemis or Diana and she wanted to hunt and she wanted to be carefree and she didn't want to be yoked to a man and a family. So um, because that was a really difficult position for some folks in the ancient world. So just to really think about this expansive um, the expansive possibilities around someone like Noria, who who might have been an example on more levels than is just obvious in the text. Well said, well said. Thank you for that. Um, so Dr. Lilly, this has been another amazing discussion. Um, hope to have you back soon. Um, but in the meantime, before we part, uh, where can people find you? Thanks so much, Susan. It's just been really great to be here um, with you again. And uh, people can find me at the University of Colorado Boulder, or they can find me at uh, the Westar Institute, so uh, westarinstitute.org. And the Westar Institute has some courses coming out, correct? Or yes, yes. So we... Uh, so we will have, um, we are starting an academy that will be, uh, that will begin in fall of 2023. And they also have ongoing opportunities to hear folks like John Dominic Crossan, other scholars. Um, we have seminars that we run where the public can actually um, listen in on scholars debating um, a myriad of um, different issues uh, in contemporary scholarship. So please check them out on a bunch of levels. It's an, It's a really interesting organization that keeps trying to push kind of into new areas of scholarship. Amazing, amazing. So yes, I encourage you all to check that out. Another forward uh, public facing uh, opportunity for you to um, learn more about the subject if you're interested. Um, I know I like to take advantage of these things when I can, so um, you should as well. Um, so until next time, Dr. Lilly, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, we will see you next time. Thanks.